of grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I call you to worship from Psalm 150 that says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we do give you all the thanks and praise, and we are eager to sing of your praises, to consider your your holiness and your greatness, and yet that grace that has come down for sinners like us. So would you receive all glory and honor, all praise, adoration, may all blessing uh, be to you, the almighty God. We worship you now in spirit and truth on your day, gathered together with great joy. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Lord of all creation, Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, and glory to the Lord on high, the God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. declares your majesty you are holy holy the lord of heaven and earth the lord of heaven and earth praise him from morning Evening. For early in the morning, I will celebrate the light. And when I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. And God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. Holy, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, the Lord of heaven and earth. The Lord of heaven and earth. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lord. wonders beyond our galaxy you are holy holy and precious Lord reveal your heart to me you are holy holy the universe declares your majesty you are holy Holy. Amen. You can turn to grace that is greater on page 21.
Is the stain that we cannot hide what can avail to wash it away look there is flowing a crimson tide wider than snow you may be His grace grace God's grace the grace and Grace that will pardon and cleanse within the grace, grace, God's grace, the grace that is greater than all our sin. Oh, grace that is greater than all our sin. Amen. Praise him for his grace. You can be seated. Here in just a moment, our ushers are going to uh, walk by, and you can worship the Lord through the giving of your love gifts. Uh, we would encourage you to enjoy that opportunity uh, to praise the Lord in that way. Before uh, we do that, let's continue to seek the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, we know that it is not we who have made ourselves, but it is you, the Almighty One, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and that is unseen. It is you. You have made us, and we are the sheep of your pasture, for it is by grace through faith in Christ. Oh, that we, straying and wandering, sinful and stupid sheep have been sought out by this gracious shepherd who has given his life, who has laid it down so that his sheep might be saved, and who through the gospel proclaimed to us in your word and through your people, we have now heard our shepherd calling, and we have responded in faith. Thank you for this gift. Lord, for we know that as you are holy, you are mighty, you are awesome, oh, too, you are merciful and gracious. You are kind, you are gentle and lowly in heart. Oh, and we need that, Lord, for our sin again has crept up this week, even today, Lord where our faith has been weak and doubting, where our tongues have been quick to hurt and cut down, where our eyes have wandered to places that they ought not to be, where our minds have not been lifted and set upon the things of heaven, but so many of the things of the earth that are fading Oh, Lord, we confess our sin is great, and yet your mercy to us in Christ, it is more. And we thank you, we praise you, just even for the beauty of the evening, the gathering of your people, and how we taste and see that you are good even now. Lord, as we head on into not only this week, but into this semester of growth groups, into 
back to school, into engaging our neighbors with acts of kindness and love and having them over. Lord, would you bless our endeavor by conforming our heart to the heart of Christ. And in doing so, would you get much glory from your people here at Cornerstone. We ask that you would be our all, our everything, our very vision. Lord, for you are the high king of heaven, and we magnify you now in Christ's name. Amen. Be Thou My Vision, number six. I'm going to ask you to stand and we'll sing again together. Bible.
prepare for the word of the Lord. In a few minutes, as the sun keeps going down, I will start having a shining face like Moses. <laughs> I hope I can still see you all. My name is Ken Sandy. I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone, and it's a great privilege this, this evening to bring God's word to you on a subject that is really important to me, because this is something that's impacted me greatly in my life. In 2007, Corlett and I had sold a house we had in the country that we bought when our mothers were living with us, and when they had passed away, we decided it was time to move into town to a smaller home, and we found a home up above Rimrock Road, and I think the Lord blinded us to how much work the house needed. <laughs> And once we closed the deal and I started looking at all the stuff I had to do before we moved in, I, I just began to get very stressed out. We had a very narrow window. And one of the things I needed to do is sheetrock one of the rooms in the basement. And I was down there one day, time was pressing in, a lot of things had gone wrong, and I was trying to get a piece of sheetrock up on the ceiling. And that's not an easy thing to do by yourself. I finally got it up against the ceiling using some props, and I put a few screws into it, not realizing I had missed the studs. So when I pulled the sports away, it sort of tremored above my head for a moment and then came crashing down. And I just literally fell to the floor and began to cry. I was so stressed out. I was so discouraged. I was so hopeless that there's any way I was going to get that house ready by the time the moving truck came up in another day. And I cried out to God. I said, God, I cannot do this. I can't do it. Help me, please. Help me. And at that moment, I heard footsteps on the stairs. Those footsteps came down the stairs, down the hallway, and in through the door walked a man named Rick Friesen, who was a dear friend and brother from my church. And he was wearing a tool belt and a drill gun in his hand and a big toolbox. Even before I had prayed the prayer, God had moved in Rick's heart to realize that Ken probably needed some help and some encouragement that day. It was 13 years ago, and I can still remember it like yesterday, and I will always love Rick Friesen because of the way he loved and he encouraged me. That day, Rick was imitating a really remarkable man in the Bible. His name is Barnabas. And we're introduced to Barnabas in Acts 4, verses 33 through 37, which is our text for today. It says this, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to all as any had need. Thus, Joseph who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. A Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas went on to be one of the most influential and inspirational leaders in the New Testament. He played a key role in launching and expanding the early church. And we can learn a vital Christian principle by noting that wherever this man is mentioned in the Bible, every place that he's mentioned, there is the activity of encouragement. It was basically prophetic when the apostles 
early in the book of Acts in chapter 4, named him the son of encouragement because through the rest of the book where his name is mentioned, he was living up to that title, the son of encouragement. A few examples. In Acts 11, 22 through 24, it says, A report came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem about the new church, the fellowship of believers in Antioch, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. In Acts 14, 21 through 22, it says this, When Paul and Barnabas had preached the gospel to Derbe, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And in chapter 15, verse 31 of Acts, it says that when Paul and Barnabas brought a letter to the church in Antioch from the Jerusalem council, and when the church read that letter, quote, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Again and again and again, this man is linked to the vital Christian ministry of encouragement. Now, when the apostles called Barnabas the son of encouragement, they used a word that's derived from the Greek word parakaleo. And this word comes from the same word that Jesus used in John 14, 16 to describe the Holy Spirit when he said this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, parakaleo, another comforter to be with you always. In other translations, that word is translated as helper or advocate, advocate or consoler. Now, as we study the many passages in the Bible that use this word, we see that encouragement can take on many forms of personal ministry, including drawing others near, inviting others to come near, comforting and consoling others when they're discouraged, when they're, when they're losing hope, exhorting others to action or giving advice, support, practical support, or hope. Those are the things that encouragers bring to others. Now, all of these meanings are encompassed very well in the modern English word encourage, which actually comes from an old French word which means to give courage, to make strong, to give hope, to give courage, to make strong, to give hope. Now, if I was asked to capture all those concepts, all those qualities in one metaphor, something you could visualize. I love the metaphor of seeking to put wind under the wings of every person you meet. And that metaphor is, is derived basically from the, what, what goes on with eagles. Eagles are sometimes seen soaring at 10 to 15,000 feet in the air. They do not have the strength or the energy reserves to flap themselves to that altitude. How do they get there? They get there by flying around until they find a thermal, an updraft of warm air, and they spread their wings out wide, those feathers go out wide, and it's just like an elevator, that warm air just takes them up in the air. And that's what an encourager does, comes alongside people who are laboring just sometimes to stay in the air, to stay afloat, to keep going, and comes under the wings of that person and lifts them to heights they would never get to on their own as they give them courage and support and hope by putting wind under their wings. Now, unfortunately, many Christians have not cultivated the habit of encouraging others. Too many of us are still spiritually immature. We're still so wrapped up in our own world, our own agendas, our own discouragements, our own problems. We're weighted down by those things, and because we're weighted down by those things, we, instead of putting wind under the wings of others, we put bricks on their backs. 
We drag them down. Why? Because we have developed habits of defaulting to attitudes and words of criticism, pessimism, grumbling, complaining. And as Paul rebuked the church in Corinth, to fits of jealousy and even quarreling, being contentious. If we indulge any of those behaviors, if we become sons and daughters of discouragement, we drag people down. We cause them to lose confidence, to lose enthusiasm. We take away their joy and we take away their hope. Now that's doubly serious. Because not only do we drag others down with those attitudes and habits, but we, they, they, those habits backfire on us. They quash our faith and they delete or d- diminish our intimacy with God. Those attitudes drive us away from God. As Charles Spurgeon wrote when he was describing the Israelites' discouraging behavior toward Moses in the promised land, as they were going to the promised land, and they were grumbling and complaining all the time. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, grumbling is the seed of God hatred. When we start grumbling about life and complaining about what's going on, it's ultimately a negative attitude toward God, who in his providence and sovereignty is controlling all the events in our lives. So we're ultimately grumbling against him. The Apostle Paul calls us out of that kind of behavior, out of that kind of spiritual immaturity in Philippians 2.14 through 15, where he says, do all things without grumbling or complaining or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine, you shine as lights in the world. In other words, Paul is calling us to renounce the spiritual immaturity of discouraging attitudes and behavior and to embrace and take on spiritual maturity that we see in a man like Barnabas as we become encouragers. Now, one of the best ways to learn how to become an encourager is to study Barnabas. His life is very informative, and it shows us how we can cultivate the character qualities that made him a son of encouragement. The defining characteristic, if there's one characteristic to cultivate that will inevitably overflow in encouragement, it's the quality that was dominant in Barnabas' life. He trusted in Jesus Christ and he believed in the gospel message that Jesus had died to pay the penalty for his sins. He'd been resurrected from the grave to give us all new life. That was the inspiring, guiding principle, the passion of Barnabas' life was the gospel itself. It's what inspired him to move and to go on grueling and painful and life-threatening missionary journeys. It's what inspired him to proclaim Christ to hostile crowds. It's what inspired him to offer endless encouragement everywhere he went to all those who believe in his message. And by God's grace, those efforts bore incredible fruit because frequently in the book of Acts, where Barnabas is mentioned, as in 11, Acts 11, 24, it says things like this, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. If we want to be an effective, fruitful witness for Christ, a character quality that anybody who's around us for very long, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, should say, if there's one thing I'd say about you, you're an encourager. You encourage me, just being around you. Now, what are some of the qualities, the specific qualities that flowed from that faith? Number one, Barnabas was a man who rejoiced. He overflowed in joy wherever he went, even in difficult circumstances. Acts 11.23 and 15.3 reveal that he brought great joy to every church, every group of Christians he went to. And Proverbs 17.22 tells us how important this is. It says a cheerful heart is good medicine. It's therapeutic. It's restorative. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Like Barnabas, an encourager must be a person with whom it's a joy 
to be associated. You, you enjoy seeing this person coming because you know when you're with this person, you're around this person, your spirits are lifted. There's joy. Acts 11.24 tells us that Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit, another one of his defining qualities. Romans 8.6 emphasizes the value of that quality of being filled with the Holy Spirit because Paul says the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. Incredibly important qualities of encouragement. And because Paul, Barnabas was a man full of the Holy Spirit, encouragement flowed from him as naturally and as consistently as cool water from a mountain spring. He didn't have to consciously say, oh, now I better be encouraging. It just is part of his nature. It just flowed from him naturally. Acts eleven twenty five through 26 shows that Barnabas was also a man of observation and discernment. He studied people. He was other aware. He was empathetic and sympathetic. He was reading people's body language, listening to their voices, observing and evaluating their circumstances, understanding their pressures, seeing the opportunities that were before them. This is borne out in Acts 11 where it talks about the, the development of a predominantly Gentile church in Antioch provided a tremendous opportunity, basically a base of operations for taking the gospel into the Gentile world. But the presence of Gentiles in the church also created an opportunity for conflict and tension and jealousy between that church and the church of Jewish believers in Jerusalem. When Barnabas went up to Antioch and he saw the situation, he, he checked it out. He said, what can I do to encourage these people? He realized there was a man who'd been well prepared to minister to and serve in that situation, the Apostle Paul. And Barnabas is the one that went and got Paul, a blue-blooded Jewish Christian, to come to Antioch to teach the new converts of that church and to reconcile the religious tensions between the Jew Gentile believers and the Jewish believers. Clearly, Barnabas had an investigative attitude. His mind was evaluating, taking in information. He was looking outward, not just inward. And he knew what kind of encouragement a particular group or even an individual person needed. Acts 11.22 shows that Barnabas was grounded in the word and able to share it with others, another vital aspect of encouragement. It was Barnabas who was selected by the church in Jerusalem to go down to Antioch. When they heard that there was a new group of believers there, they, they needed to find out, is this a solid group? Are these people orthodox? Are they teaching the true gospel? And they selected Barnabas to go there and and meet them and talk with them and discern the authenticity of their faith and of their doctrine. Those elders sent him there because they were confident in his discernment and the skills he had for teaching and encouraging others. In that same section, we see that Barnabas was also accepting of others, accepting of others in spite of major significant differences. You know, we live in a time of incredible tribalism, of people breaking into groups and defining their group with boundary lines. We believe in this, and if you don't believe in this, you are outside our group. And that tribalism, that fractioning, is going on in the church today, in churches that have had lots of consistency and uniformity, but Recent stresses in our culture have stimulated this attitude of drawing boundary lines and seeing differences and excluding people who are different. And it's tearing some churches apart. Barnabas overcame that. And he gives us an example of somebody who can go to Gentile believers, tremendously different life customs and spiritual customs, family customs, all sorts of things, and Jewish people over here, and he's able to bring them together and overlook the differences and see what they had in common, which was faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. That was the dominant, central, common ground in spite of lots of other differences. He didn't shun the Gentiles. He rejoiced. 
He rejoiced that the gospel was reaching out to a group of people who had been excluded from God's family for generations. Barnabas' ministry partner was the, the Apostle Paul, and I can imagine they had many, many long conversations about how to live out the gospel, how to apply the gospel to the churches they were founding. And one of the things Paul later wrote in Romans 15, 7, a verse that we should all take to heart, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. How How big was the difference between you and Christ? How large a chasm separated you from a holy God? Infinitely wide. Infinitely wide. And yet Jesus Christ bridged that chasm. As it says in Ephesians, he's the one who came down and brought unity to the church. But first, he himself came down through the incarnation and embraced a fallen mankind. If we follow that example, can we not be more accepting of people who might differ from us on things that are so small in comparison? An encourager must be always willing to accept people as they are at the moment, but then lovingly encourage and exhort them to move on to more godly attitudes and behavior. Acts 4, 36 and 37 illustrates another key quality that we need more of today. Submission and accountability in the body of Christ. Paul was a man of status. He was a Roman citizen. He was a man of means, of wealth, and yet he was willing to share his personal wealth, denying himself and giving it to a higher cause. He submitted himself to the needs of the body, the new body of believers in Jerusalem. And he was not only submissive to God in that action, but he was also submissive to the leaders of the church. He didn't just launch out into a ministry, a missionary ministry on his own, he was in Antioch, and the elders came together, and they fasted, and they prayed. And when those elders, through that fasting and prayer, decided to send out Paul and Barnabas as the first missionary team, Barnabas submitted himself to that call. And as they completed that missionary journey, they came back to Antioch. They came back, and they gave the report to the elders to basically submit what they'd accomplished for review and even critique of the elders of the church. So here's a man who was a teacher. He was a representative of the church in Jerusalem, and still he submitted himself and showed consistent respect and respect and a submission to the church there in Antioch. There's one final quality in Barnabas that's revealed throughout the book of Acts, and it's essential for being an encouraging person, and that quality is humility. Humility. We see this in so many ways in Barnabas' life and the narrative about him. There was a constant dependence on prayer. He, said, he knew, I can't do this in my own strength. I don't have it in me. Continually looking to God, praying to God for strength and guidance his submission to church authority, his faith in Christ, his correcting a crowd when they're proclaiming Paul and Barnabas as gods, he rebuked them and said, no. He's getting so the ultimate acclamation, and he didn't, he didn't enjoy it for a moment. He was horrified by it. He was, another interesting thing I find as you read the book of Acts, in the first part of the book, once he teams up with Paul, you see the phrase Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. And then partway through the book of Acts, it switches. Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. As Paul became greater, Barnabas willingly made himself less. He didn't demand prime billing. He was happy to support and encourage his brother Paul, who went on to be the premier 
apostle to the Gentiles. Regardless of the success he experienced as a missionary, Barnabas always recognized his only value came from the fact that he was, in the words of 2 Timothy 2.21, merely a vessel for God's use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Humility. Humility. Now, as wonderful as the example of Barnabas is, he is simply an example of the greatest encourager the world has ever known, the source of encouragement, not just the son of encouragement, but the source, and that is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. As you read the gospel, you'll see every one of these qualities I've just described. Over and over and over attributed to Christ. He was, more than any man who walked the face of the earth, full of the Holy Spirit. He rejoiced again and again in the work of his Father, and he submitted himself completely to the point of dying on a cross to the Father's salvation plan. Jesus was amazingly observant and discerning. He could look into the heart of men and women and know what they were thinking and feeling and planning and hoping and dreaming. The ultimate observant man. He accepted everyone who was seeking God. No matter where they were on their journey at that moment, as long as they were seeking God, even if they were incredibly messed up in some of their views, still holding on to old ideas, as many of the Jewish Christians did, the circumcision group. But Jesus was incredibly accepting as he walked the face of the earth. Whether he was talking to a religious leader who was still bound up with Old Testament traditions, a tax collector, a prostitute, a Roman centurion, a small child, even the outcast leper. He accepted them all. He encouraged them all. Jesus was also the most humble person who ever walked the face of the earth. Though the Son of God, sitting enthroned in heaven, he humbled himself and came down to earth. And he humbled himself all the way to death on a cross. In passage after passage, we see Jesus was, in fact, the ultimate example of an encourager. He was always drawing other people near. He was always offering them comfort and consolation. He was always exhorting others to action and giving them wise instruction and support and hope. All these qualities are captured so beautifully in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, which says this, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. As the scriptures indicate when they describe Jesus to us, he was the greatest encourager. And he not only put wind under the wings of people he encountered in this life, lifting them out of their discouraging past, their the caste system, their poverty of finance, their illness. He put wind under the wings of so many people in daily life. But most of all, what he did is he blew this wind of his spirit into their lives, into our lives, so that one day he will lift us all the way to heaven itself, the ultimate act of encouragement bringing us to be with him. So how does all this relate to you and me? Is this just an interesting character study? Are these just some good examples we should talk about and admire? No. I hope what you're thinking by now is, how can I become an encourager? How can I imitate Christ? How can we obey the commandment in Ephesians 5.11, therefore be imitators of God? as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. We are the children of God, and we are called to bear the family image. 
And one of the predominant family images we have in Christ is that of encouragement, parakaleo. Other passages in the Bible zero in very specifically on this command. This is not optional behavior. Well, some Christians would be encouragers. That's not my thing. No. It is commanded of every person who claims to follow Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. That is a commandment, a non-optional commandment. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good words, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. A primary reason for gathering together on the Lord's day and even, in my opinion, a high motivation to be in growth groups, gathering together with other believers, is to encourage them. Do we come to church on Sunday mainly thinking, what am I going to receive today? What am I going to get out of the message today? How will I feel when I leave today? Or do we come praying, God, fill me with your spirit. Even this moment as I come to gather with my brothers and sisters, and Lord, help me to be observant and discerning and see every way I can encourage others. I can give them hope. I can support them. I can give them a a meaningful word from Scripture. Is that how you view Sunday? If not, I encourage you. Make that your prayer on your way here each week. And even as you go to a growth group is, Lord, make me a Barnabas tonight, this morning, a son or a daughter of encouragement. So let's get really practical. Let me give you some examples. I think the most vivid act of encouragement I have seen in recent years took place over the last 12 months as my wife, Corlette, was going through chemo treatment for cancer. The prayers, the cards, the meals, the visits blew us away. Constantly, week after week, the people in this church reached out to encourage Corlette and encourage me. I couldn't even begin to name all the people who served us. But I can still vividly remember one day as I was looking out the window and seeing seeing Jeff Damon out there mowing my yard. Something as simple as that put wind under my wings. And when Corlette finished her treatment, and I put an announcement in the church prayer Uh, Facebook page, it said, hey, Corlette's going to finish treatment today. If you have time, come and join us down at the clinic as she rings the bell. And I didn't know how many would show up. We packed that hallway. The nurses in the chemo ward were stunned seeing all of the people from this church packed into that hallway to celebrate Corlette's completion of chemo and to rejoice with us. And we prayed together as about a dozen nurses stood there observing this body live out the ministry of encouragement. You know, week by week, I get encouragement from people who simply pray for me. I get text messages and emails of prayers for what's going on in my life as as an elder, what's going on in our ministry, and it means so much to me. Never underestimate the power of a smile to encourage people. God gave us this capacity to change the expression on our face and communicate without even sharing any words with somebody that we're glad to see them. And it encourages them. It makes them happy. When you smile at somebody, it does something inside of them. Psychologists call it mirror neurons that their brain reacts when they see you smile, neurons in their brain that are tied to smiling react, and pretty soon, what do they do? They smile. Smiling has an incredible power to lift the spirits of other people. 
As Proverbs 15.30 says, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart. The expressions of our face lift our heart. And I can tell you there's no smile that encourages me more than when I walk in the door of my house and my wife turns from whatever she's doing and she smiles at me. Oh, what a joy. Expressing thanks and appreciation to other people, support for them, belief in them. I've got one good friend that every time I talk with him, every time I talk with him, he will not end the conversation without saying, Ken, I believe in you. Ken, I believe in you. He has no idea. Well, he does, because I've told him how much that means to me. How much that means to me. Meeting physical needs can sometimes actually save a marriage. I'm putting stainless steel covers on my rain gutters, and Corlette said she was going to kill me if I went up on the ladder without support. And I mentioned that to Steve Glantz, and he came over and he held the ladder <laughs> to keep me safe on that ladder and to keep my wife from being unhappy with me. I don't think she really would have killed me, but she really did want me to be safe. It could be something as simple as a hug. On Saturday or Sunday morning when I come to church, I'm scanning the audience. I'm scanning who's here. I want to know who's here. I rejoice every time I see your faces here and then I see new people, familiar faces. But there's one face in particular I really look around for. It's Andrea Burnham. Because every Sunday she comes up and she gives me a hug. It just means the world to me. She probably thinks it's no big deal, but it, I look for her. There she is. If I walk over close, she'll see me and give me a hug. And I know in our social distancing world, we're not supposed to do things like that, but you can still smile from six feet away. And sometimes you just have to cross that distance and express it in other ways. You know, simple daily gestures of thoughtfulness are encouraging. A good friend of mine um, passed away a while ago, and his wife was telling, talking to Corlette, and she said one of the many things she misses about her husband was every morning he would get up and make a cup of coffee and give it to her as she was putting, get her hair and makeup ready for the day. And I, I was just struck by that, of all the wonderful things in their marriage over all those years. That was just one of the little gestures that every day was so meaningful. So now when I get up in the morning, I make coffee, and I take a cup into my wife, a small gesture to say, I'm thinking of you. I love you. I treasure you. Bringing good news to people instead of bad news, gloomy news. You know, there's so many of us using social media today to spread bad, discouraging news, negative reports that don't put wind under anyone's wings. Hey, did you see this bad news today? What good does that do? Now, if there's some particular issue you're involved in, if you're in a political group or some kind of group that you're doing something about those issues, by all means, inform people who can take action. But if it's just sharing bad, gloomy news, why? Why not instead use our social media to encourage, to live out the things commanded in Scripture to encourage one another? You know, there's other things I preached about, about making charitable judgments, believing the best about people when you don't have clear evidence to the contrary. If you can interpret something in two different ways rather than making negative assumptions, say, no, this, there must be a reasonable explanation for this, and I'm going to go and talk to this person, believing the best about them, seeking more information rather than just jump to a negative conclusion. You know, the COVID crisis has created a lot of special, unique, heightened opportunities for encouragement. The gift of hospitality for people who are locked in and socially distanced and not even going into the office as much as they should be. I mean, there's a lot of socially starved people out there. What a great time for Christians to open their homes and invite their neighbors in for a meal or dessert or coffee or something that is hospitality offering to shop for others who are apprehensive about going to the store. I appreciate my brother-in-law, Bill Murray. Whenever he goes to the store, he calls up and says, what do you need? What can I pick up for you? 
And there's a lot of people, of course, that are afraid to go shopping because of exposure to COVID. Older people with health issues. If you have some neighbors like that, just reach out, give them a call. Can I get something for you? We've got a young couple living next to us with three little children, and they just moved to Billings recently. They don't have a big circle of friends or people around them. And uh, as I just watched this young mother (laughs) day in and day out with these little kids, I realized, wow, she's got a lot of stress in her life. And so recently we just called them up and said, hey, can we take your kids for an evening so you two can just go out and have an evening? And like, are you kidding me? And they said, absolutely. <laughs> and very quickly after that, they did. They, I, I thought they might leave town, actually. Uh, but they took off, and they had a relaxing evening, and we got to enjoy their three little children for a while. You know, even if you can't do that, can you make a plate of cookies? Just take it to your neighbor and just say, hey, I just thought these might encourage you. Chocolate chip cookies always lift my spirits. Now, that may seem insignificant, but the fact that you thought of somebody and did something like that, as you walk away from the house, they're going to stand and say, I can't believe this. They're going to have wind under their wings. Encouraging people in so many ways. If we just open our hearts and our minds. So who could you do this to this week? Who are some of the objects of our encouragement? Well, friends. We could encourage our friends. I would say if there's one person that should be the target daily, day in, day out of encouragement, if you're married, it's your spouse. Make your marriage the safest place in the world, the place of refuge, the place of encouragement by noting the qualities in your spouse, the evidences of God's grace in your spouse, thanking your spouse, greeting your spouse warmly. Call, I mean, there's so many ways to show our appreciation, our value. Children. You know, when I'm around families with young children, I notice that the natural thing is to be admonishing, correcting, rebuking, restraining, disciplining. I encourage if you've got a young family, make a conscious effort that your main thing with your kids is to encourage them, to bless them, to lift them up. They're objects. They should be objects of our encouragement. Coworkers. Retail workers, baristas, clerks in the grocery store, they can all be encouraged. Two days ago, three days ago, I had a crown put in. What a joy. And I decided, okay, I can either grumble and complain about this unpleasant process and how much expensive it's going to be, or I can encourage people. So I just started talking to the dental hygienist. I just said, you know, why'd you choose to go into this field? And she was telling me, I said, well, what do you enjoy about it? Just show some interest. And so, and she just got animated describing her job and what she likes about it. And and as the, as the dentist finished up his work and they were wrapping everything up and they did such a great job, I, I just turned to him. I said, thank you for the years you spent going to medical school, dental school, practicing and learning these things. Thank you for all the money you've invested in equipment that you use today to make this process so painless. And thank you for the skill that you showed today that blessed me so much. We can encourage people. Public servants, law enforcement. A few weeks ago, I did a sermon on the whole issue of racial reconciliation and the tensions with police. And, you know, shortly after that, someone in our church went out and bought coffee cards and sent personal notes to 190 police officers here in Billings. What an encouragement. Heard back from the police chief how much that lifted their spirits. He didn't use the phrase, wind under the wings, but that's what he was talking about. And finally, one final word. There's one group of people that we should especially be encouraging, especially during this time, and that is our pastors. The COVID crisis and all these other things, the the racial issues going on today, the economic pressures are putting enormous pressure on millions of people in this country, bringing forth tensions that have been able to be manageable in normal times are now bursting to the surface. And marital tensions, problems disciplining children, lost jobs, debt, can't pay their mortgage. And a lot of those problems, where did people take them? They take them to their pastors. 
And Jeff and Rick welcome the opportunity to shepherd and serve this church. They welcome that opportunity, as do the rest of our elders and elders in training. But I just need to tell you, they are under incredible pressure right now. There are times where they are working at midnight with a couple, sometimes in literally life and death, literally life and death counseling situations. And they have to get up the next morning and start meeting with more people the next day. We've had to actually require Rick to turn off his cell phone to get some respite from the pressure. And so I just, you know, they're like Joshua in battle. Out there, one of those battles, and Moses was there with his hands held up high, praying to God for strength for the army of Israel, and especially Joshua, who was the head of that army. And we need to be holding up our pastors in prayer. We need to be encouraging them. When you see them on Sunday or any time during the week, smile at them. If you really want to encourage a pastor, don't just say, great sermon, as you walk out the door. Instead, like Wednesday or Thursday, write a note and saying, hey, Rick, I just wanted to tell you, I found a chance to apply what you taught on Sunday. Let me tell you what happened. There's nothing that encourages a preacher of God's word more than hearing how people are actually taking the word of God, the message in that sermon, and applying it in their lives to minister to other people and exalt Christ. Now, you could do it with a text message. That's easy and sweet. But if you really want to make it meaningful, there's this old thing, old-fashioned thing. It's called a pen, and there's this thing called a note card. And you can actually write on it and then put this thing called a stamp on it and mail it. And I can tell you, they have more value than electronic media. Give some feedback, encouraging feedback on the messages and what they're doing. Express appreciation. These men labor and toil for us, and they rejoice to do it. It's a privilege, but we can put wind under their wings. We can lift them up in this work, and I particularly want to say this. Please think twice before offering criticism to our pastors. Please think twice about it. Run it through Ephesians 4.29 that says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion that may give grace to those who hear. Now, our elders value your feedback. We value your constructive criticism and your suggestions. One of the ways we get better as a church is by you communicating back to us the things that you think we're doing well and the things we can do better. If there's some lack of clarity or some question that comes out of a sermon or anything we do, we want that feedback. We're not saying don't bring it to us. But I would encourage you with this very simple principle that I tried to apply with my children. For every word of correction I gave to my children, I tried to be sure that I first offered them 10 words of encouragement. Are we giving more encouragement than we are criticism to the people around us? Pretty simple rule to follow. Now, not many of us are natural encouragers, but this is a capacity that's designed into us because God made us in his image, and he's the ultimate encourager. And the Bible says that one of his goals in life is to conform us to the image of God. So let's pray every day in the days ahead, especially during these tumultuous times, that by God's grace, this quality will become more and more evident in us. Not that we have to consciously think about it, but it just becomes our natural way of being. That we overflow so naturally in all these qualities of encouragement that people would look at us and they would see us as sons and daughters of encouragement. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the examples we have in Barnabas and even more so in Jesus himself of this ministry of encouragement. We pray, God, for your spirit to work in us, to transform us, that we would be like them. Help us to encourage one another, Lord. Help us to open our eyes to see the examples in our own body of people who have this gift, and let us follow their example as well. That the people in this church would be known by this quality, the gift, the ministry 
of encouraging one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.